So, I am Hang Le To, the Professional Fiduciary Bureau Vice Chair of Committee Members. I am calling for the meeting to order at 10.15 a.m. This meeting is open to public at the following locations. 1747 North Market Boulevard in Sacramento, and 6345 Boboa Boulevard in Encino. Com committee member Eileen Federizo is present at the location in Encino and will be connected to the meeting via teleconference. Now we go to item number two. I would like to invite Ms. Tracy Montes, Division of Programs and Policy Review Chief, to do the roll call. And at this time, I would like Angela to do the roll call to establish a quorum. Barbara DeVries is not here today. Hang Lee Doe. Present. Don Nickel. Present. Jenny Chacon. Present. Eileen Federizo. Present. King G. Present. And Kathleen Thompson. Present. We have a quorum established with six members present. I'd like to do just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Eileen, please make sure to keep your phone on mute while you are not speaking. And to all the committee members and to the public, please state your name each time before speaking and speak directly into the microphone that, so that all comments can be heard in the meeting room as well as by, by the webcast viewers. And when you are not speaking, please turn off your microphones. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Then thank you, Tracy. So now we are on item number three. We are, now we're asking Tracy to update the status of bureau chief position. Thank you, Tracy Montez. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Julie Ansel for her service as the bureau chief. I was hoping Julie might be able to, oh, there she is. Huh? Yay, Julie's there. Thank you very much, Julie, uh, for serving as the bureau chief. I'm glad you could make it today. Um, I also would like to let the others know or remind them that the bureau chief position is appointed by the governor and an announcement will be forthcoming once we know or hear from the governor's office on the status. So we are in a holding pattern at the moment. Julie, would you like to maybe make a comment or two? Um, just uh, thank you. I would like to add, too, that um, Julie has been available and helpful during this transition time, so we greatly appreciate it. Hi, this is Eileen Federico. Um, I think Julie spoke, but I don't get the audio for her. Just a little FYI. We cannot hear you very well, Eileen, but you're correct. Julie did not go to the microphone. <laughs> Sorry, Eileen. I just basically said that I'm just so appreciative um, with working with um, so many professionals um, and just the time that everybody's given to the Bureau and um, just thank you for everything that you've done. And um, if you need anything in the future, I am still with DCA and um, anything you need, just call me. I'm here and I'm happy to continue to support. Thank you, Julie. Any um, public comment? No? Thank you, Tracy. Um, now we go to the item number four. Um, we are going to do introductions. The Department of Consumer Affairs staff, committee members to introduce themselves. So we can start at the uh, left, to the left. Um, Jenny Chacon, I have been, uh, this is my 
going on my second year on the committee, and I am from San Francisco, and I do um, quality improvement and policy at um, the Zuckerberg Central General Hospital. Tahana Kel, fiduciary. Uh, this is my first year on the council. Um, I work in Sacramento and Northern California. Kathleen Thompson, I'm the supervising court investigator for Solano County. King G, and uh, I'm formerly uh, a board member of the Asian Community Center, and uh, as such, I'm uh, the, rep the senior representative on this uh, committee. Uh, my name is Hang Lei To. Um, I'm the financial director of the San Francisco Labor Council, and uh, I have been served. This is my second term, and but the second years on the uh, committee um, member as a committee member of uh, professional fiduciary bureau. And I'm Tracy Montez. I'm division chief of the program and policy review division here at DCA, and I am filling in uh, during the vacancy of your bureau chief. I am Gary Duke, and I'm a senior staff counsel with the Department of Consumer Affairs, and uh, been working at DCA for the last 25 years. I'm Angela Quadra, the program analyst for the Professional Fiduciary Bureau. Would there any uh, public, I'm sorry. Oh, yes, Eileen, I'm sorry. Hi. Miss you. I, yes. Hi. Hi. It's great to hear everybody. This is Eileen Federico. I'm a geriatric social worker and private professional fiduciary serving the LA area. Thank you, Eileen. Are there any uh, public members who want to introduce yourself? Good morning, Christine Lally. Good morning, members. Christine Lally, Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Relations with the Department of Consumer Affairs. Happy always to join you, and um, thank you, Tracy. You have a great asset with Tracy helping uh, the Bureau during this transition, and a big thank you to Jolie. She was a fantastic Bureau Chief, and we're so fortunate that she's still with the Department. So, thank you. Thank you. So now we go to item number five. Uh, now we are asking um, Tracy to read the Professional Fiduciary Bureau mission statement. Thank you. The Professional Fiduciary Bureau vision is to protect, maintain, and enhance the quality of life for consumers by promoting the highest professional fiduciary standards. The mission includes protecting consumers through licensing, education, and enforcement by ensuring the competency and ethical standards of professional fiduciaries. Thank you, Tracy. Is there any public comment? No? Okay, thank you. Now we go to the item number six. I'm asking committee members if, they are, uh, if they have any chance to review the minute from the May 3rd, 2016. Um, just give uh, everybody a minute review. So, is there a motion to approve the minutes? This is Eileen Federico. I move to up the minutes from the May 3rd meeting. Is there a second to the motion? Second to the motion. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Eileen. Okay, is there any discussion from the committee members? No. Is there any public comment? 
Okay, uh, we're going to do the roll call, Angela. <clears throat> a motion and a second has been made to approve the minutes as written. Now I'll take a vote by roll call. Barbara DeVries is absent. Hangley Doe? Uh, second. Donna Kell? Approved. Jenny Chacon? Approved. Eileen Federizo? Approved. King G? Approved. Kathleen Thompson? Approved. The minutes are approved as written and will be posted to the Bureau's website as public record. Thank you. So now we will go to the number seven. I would like to invite the Department of Consumer Affairs Executive Staff to present the updates. Good morning, committee members. It's a pleasure to be with you again today. Thank you for the opportunity to address you on behalf of the Department of Consumer Affairs. I am Shelley Jones, and I'm a manager with the Board and Bureau Relations Division. First, I want to update the committee on changes to the department's executive team. In late June, Governor Brown appointed Jeff Mason as Chief Deputy Director. Jeff has been with the department since 2013, serving as Chief for the Bureau of Security and Investigative Services, and most recently as Chief Deputy Commissioner for the Bureau of Real Estate. We're excited to have him on board. Also in May, Melinda McLean, the department's de Deputy Director for Legislation and Regulatory Review, accepted a new position in the governor's office. In late July, Governor Brown announced his appointment of Adam Quinones as Deputy Director for Legislative and Regulatory Review. Adam previously served with Melinda as Assistant Deputy Director for Legislation. Finally, also in May, DCA's Assistant Chief Counsel, Tamara Colson, was appointed as Assistant Chief Counsel for the Bureau of Medical Cannabis Regulation. The governor appointed Ryan Marcroft, previously a Deputy Attorney General at the California Department of Justice, to replace Ms. Colson. Ryan started with the department just this Monday. The department has implemented a process to assist its programs with onboarding new executive officers and bureau chiefs to ensure a smooth transition for new leaders joining DCA. Part of the process includes making all DCA division heads available to the new EO or bureau chief for a briefing on the services provided by that division and the work currently in process between the division and the board or bureau. For example, the Division of Legislative and Regulatory Review will meet with a new bureau chief to re review recently passed and pending legislation impacting the bureau, as well as to discuss the legislative and regulatory process. DCA will also provide the new EO or chief with information on the department and the board or bureau, such as contact lists, strategic plans, organizational charts, and fund conditions that will help bring the new EO or chief up to speed. As you may know, the Department's Solid Training and Planning Solutions Unit is dedicated to organizational development and offers a wide array of services to DCA's bureaus and boards. During the last week of September, the third Solid-sponsored brown bag gathering for executive officers and bureau chiefs will be held. The agenda includes psychological safe workplaces, building a work philosophy, a peer panel, and an update on the future leadership development program. The peer panel and meeting date will be finalized this week, and Outlook invitations will be subsequently sent out. One of the initiatives discussed at the EO Brown Bag Gathering that we are very excited about is the creation of the Future Leadership Development Program. This initiative is designed to assist the department and its programs in growing the next generation of extraordinary bureau chiefs and executive officers. The Future Leadership Development Program will have three parts to assist in the development of managers into executives. Training will be available and alongside executive officers and bureau chiefs. Mentorship opportunities from executives throughout the department and its boards and bureaus. And completion of special projects designed to benefit the participants as well as the department and its boards and bureaus. The projects will be designed to address specific problems or issues facing the department and its boards and bureaus, which are expected to be collected during the EO Brown Bag gatherings. Finally, this year, the department will develop a new strategic plan for the years 2017 through 2019. One of the components of the strategic planning process is a survey of stakeholders. This survey will be distributed to stakeholders, including advisory committee members, in mid-September. Your feedback is vital, and we respectfully ask for your participation to assist us improving the department's services. 
This concludes my update from the Department of Consumer Affairs. Thank you again for your opportunity. Thank you, Shelley. Is there any committee members coming? Just a, out of curiosity, what is the psychological safe workplace? What, is, what does that encompass? That's a very good question that I do not have the answer with right. today, but we can definitely get some more information to you on that. I'm just curious. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Danny? Just another curious, curious uh -huh. as well is, so what, how are you selecting the future um, leadership uh, trainees? What criteria are you using to stick them into that program and be mentors? I actually haven't seen that information yet, but again, we can get that information and get that back to you. Any other committee members comment? Any uh, public comments? No? Thank you. Sean. Thank you. Now we are at the uh, number item, the item number eight. I would like to invite the Department of Consumer Affairs budget analyst representative to present the budget update. I'll just introduce myself. I'm Marina O'Connor. I'm a budget man manager in the DCA budget office. Good morning, and I'm Matt Nishimini. I'm your uh, new uh, budget analyst, DCA budget analyst, and I'm happy to be here. Um, in your packet, we provided you with a fund condition statement as well as um, uh, an expenditure report from last year. Um, the, the Bureau nearly fully expended its full appropriation. It came in just over $1,000 in savings. So it's very tight. Excuse me, this is Eileen Federiza. Is it possible for you to speak up or to the mic? Oh, yep, can you hear me now? Wonderful, thank you. Oh, sorry. Yep. So I was just stating that the, um, the Bureau nearly fully expended its appropriation in the fiscal year 15-16. And I'm happy to answer any uh, specific questions that the committee may have. So, Mark, maybe you want to, uh, anything that you want to point down to our committee members? Well, we would point, we would note that the bureau has a has a small budget and it's very tight and historically it's been tight and so the bureau and the budget office have been working together over the past few years and will continue to monitor the spending uh, because uh, we need to just constantly monitor and make sure that you're within your authority. Uh, Tracy Montez and I just um, would like to add that one um, item obviously that I'd like to work on with the new bureau chief is how to um, increase the license uh, number of licensees, what type of outreach or programs we can do with the colleges. I've actually, uh, Angela's been working on this a little bit as well. Um, how can we make uh, folks aware of this program and this need because we see this as um, a real need in the future with the aging population and again with the assistance that these professional judiciaries can provide and I think that that would be also you know helpful uh, for the budget to grow because we do have a very lean budget and at the same time we want to be sensitive to fees and other things associated with the program so um, that's something on our agenda and that we can definitely build into the strategic plan. Thank you. Yeah, I act, this is Eileen Federizo. I recall that that was part or that was incorporated in our um, strategic plan. So yes, we should definitely talk about that more. Um, I do have a question about the budget. Uh, so we have about 4.7 in reserve. Is that, was that the goal? A healthy reserve uh, balance is between three and six months. There's a statutory cap of six months. So okay. you're, right in the, you're right in the good area. And then I would note on the fund condition statement in uh, BY and BY uh, plus one, so in 17, 18, and 18, 19, uh, the projection is increasing. Okay. 
So the Bureau's yeah. not in a structural deficit. I'm sorry, did you say that the statutory cap was? Six months. Any other committee members' comments? Is there any public comments? No? Thank you, Mariano, and thank you, Matt. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we go to the item number nine. I would like to invite the Department of Consumer Affairs Legislative Analyst to present the legislative update. Good morning. I am Natalie Martin Rojas. I am the legislative analyst for the department that's assigned to the Professional Fiduciaries Bureau. Um, at the request of the um, of of the um, advisory board um, from last meeting, I have sh considerably shortened the list of legislation uh, to present to you today. So the first um, thing is at the top, we have the important legislative deadlines. Um, August 31st is effectively the last day of the 2015-2016 legislative session. So after that, um, there will be no more activity in the legislature for this year. So everything must be passed. Um, by uh, you know by that date, if it wants to go to the governor's desk, um, sep uh, September 13 is the last day. Or excuse me, September 30th is the last day for the governor to sign or veto bills um, that were passed by the legislature by the 31st, um, and there and in his possession on or after September 31st. So there will be lots of activity um, coming out that were that are related to um, some of the bills that I'm going to be presenting to you today. So um, the first or the second section is the 2016 legislative legislation related to the bureau. Um, that's AB 1580 by um, Assemblymember Gatto. Um, consumer credit reports security freezes um, regarding protected consumers. So basically, this authorizes the representative of a protected consumer, well, it defines a protected consumer um, and authorizes a representative of the protected consumer to place a security freeze on their, um, on their protected consumer's credit report or file. Um, and this basically is in response to um, folks trying to do that, you know, in case of identity, identity theft and things like that. And um, credit bureaus not really having a uniform way to do that at present. So this law would, um, or this bill would do that. This has currently been passed in, and enrolled um, by the legislature and is now headed to the governor's desk for um, either veto or signature. The next is AB 1700, Assemblymember Mainsheen, regarding trusts notice and proposed notice of proposed action by trustees. This bill would authorize a trustee to provide a notice of proposed action for preliminary and, dis and final discharges and would reduce the minimum amount of time within which objections to proposed action can be made from 30 days, um, uh, for, excuse me, to, to 30 days from the date of mailing of the notice. This bill has been passed, signed, and chapter, so this is now law. 2016 legislation um, related to all DCA programs that are um, of, or that are no, of note to the um, to the bureau is AB 2859 by Assemblymember Lowe. Um, this bill would allow all programs within the department to issue issue a retired license. So basically, create and issue a retired license within specific limitations. Um, this bill has actually been passed and is headed to concurrence um, because there were some amendments that were taken um, to be more sensitive to some of the boards and bureaus that do not or that already have retired license types. There were some potential conflicts and those have been since worked out. Um, the next is SB 1130 um, by Senator Wykowski. Um, this is related to false advertising and substantiation of claims um, um, related to county council. The, this bill would allow a county council to take the same actions as the director of, the, of DCA, the attorney general, and any city or any district attorney when the failure of an advertiser to adequately substantiate a claim within a reasonable time occurs or if the requesting official has reason to believe that the an advertising claim is false or misleading. And this bill arose from um, basically all of those other folks have the uh, authority to go and do those types of investigation, but the county council, for whatever reason, did not. And now they do because this bill has been passed, signed, and now chapters, so it is law. 
Um, before we move on to the um, requested legislative updates, do any of the board members have any questions about the bills that I've just reviewed? Hi, this is Eileen Federica. Mm -hmm. So for A1700, uh, it says uh, final or preliminary, or preliminary or final discharges. Uh, do you mean dissolution? Because as a trustee, we do preliminary and final distributions, not charges. I believe that, yeah, that could possibly be a uh, a typo. I can double check and let's see. Yeah, just actually, I think that yeah, is correct. Yeah, distribution. Because we do proposed preliminary distributions and final distributions. Let me check real Thank quick. You. One second, I'll check on that. Sorry, this is Ivy. I have another question. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I noticed that I noticed that uh, uh, we don't necessarily follow uh, legislation related to caregivers. Um, but one of the things that I'm finding as a fiduciary is that there are so many caregiver uh, legislations happening that, that directly impact the consumers, and so particularly related to the increasing caregiver costs. And so I'm wondering if it would be advantageous to follow those. I'll bring that up to my manager. Um, currently, we, I mean, there, those are um, reviewed by um, the uh, by the departments that that they're more, that are more directly related to it. So you know, Department of Public Health and. Uh, um, social services and things like that. Um, but if there is something of note, then you know that, that you guys would like to recommend that we provide an update on. Um, you are more than welcome to um, make those recommendations through your staff, and we can do that in the future. Okay. So should I bring it up later for the future agenda item? Yes. I think what she's asking, okay. Eileen, is if you have something specific. A specific bill you would like us to look at, not just um, all the bills. I see. Yeah, I, I guess I don't really particularly know about the the bill, but I know that there there are certain uh, uh, caregiver related bills that are uh, uh, related to the the increasing their pay, and um, I know it's an ongoing issue, and. and does it affect and who is who are the other fiduciaries here on the bureau or what are the other bureau? Hi, Eileen. Feel? It's Dawn. I'm in the Hi. same. I agree with you. The more we know about the caregiver situation and the finances and how that will affect, would be great as fiduciaries since we deal in that quadrant a lot. So, Tracy, you want to add? So how about if I do some follow-up with uh, the legislative office to get those bills and then follow up with the actual uh, licensees and then we can take that list and identify what the most pertinent bills are to follow up on and then bring that back to the next meeting. That would be excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. And so to answer your first question about AB 1700, um, you're, you're correct. This is, that was a typo. So this is preliminary and final distributions. Or excuse me, it's a yes. Um, so moving forward, the board requested le legislative updates, AB 2701 um, by Assemblymember Jones. Um, this was related to training requirements for uh, the for boards and bureaus and commissions, um, et cetera, under the department. Under the department, um, so this basically would um, would or would have because it, it it was it's done it's. It was dead then, it's still dead, has not been revived um, or um, inserted into another bill. And um, the question was um, what, or basically what, you know, were there different standards for different boards and bureaus? And the answer is that there, it's not. Because under statute, boards are defined as boards, bureaus, commissions, et cetera. So the requirements that are, um, that the, 
that the requirement, or excuse me, the requirement for training for board members covers all boards, bureaus, and commissions. So um, we do that every year with the board member orientation training, um, also known as the BMOT. So um, if you are interested in that, um, please let the staff member know so we can um, make sure that we, you guys are notified about um, when, we're when we do that each and every year. And the last one is SB 1284 by Assemblymember Hernandez. Um, this is related to human remains, the conservator or the person or of, of the person or the estate. Um, this bill would add a conservator or of the person or and a conservator of the estate to the above provision for purposes of relinquishment. If the agent under a power of attorney, the surviving spouse, or any other specified relatives who have the right to control the disposition and arrange for funeral goods and services fails to act or cannot be found within a specified period, that the person's right to control the disposition and arrange for, for well, that's a, a uh, sentence fragment. I apologize. <laughs> Basically, um, the question about this, what, uh, about this bill was, um, if the conservator came after the family members, or basically, basically what was the conservator's role um, and how, you know, as a result of this bill. And so um, the conservator has now been um, explicitly added to the list of succession of internment rights to include, you know, the conservators of the person or the estate. But the family members do, um, are placed, you know, higher on the hierarchy. Um, however, if the family cannot agree on arrangements, the funeral establishment can petition in court to establish among the listed individuals, so the conservator being one of them, who has control of the remains. Do you know if that requires, this is self interest here, um, mm -hmm. an investigation by a court investigator? Is there a mandate in that bill that says that? There's an investigation required. Let me check the bill language. I, can, I assume I can read it since it's been passed, signed, and chaptered. Mm -hmm. But offhand, you don't know? Uh, offhand, I do not know. Okay. I'll have to read the whole thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Thank you, Natalie. So now we are at the item number 10. I would like to invite Tracy back to present the bureau updates. Okay, you have a couple handouts in your packet. Um, we have our complaint statistics by fiscal year and licensing statistics by fiscal year. And you had asked at the last advisory committee meeting to um, give you some information to allow for comparison, so we have provided that for you. Um, I'll just highlight a few things. We have active licensees, 712, new licenses issued, 81, total licenses issued, 932. Looking over at the complaints, we have received 136, um, and this I should say is for the fiscal year 2015-16. Complaints closed, 106. Those pending, 103. Average days to close, 154. Accusations filed, one. Citations issued, seven. And just some, again, things to keep in mind here with regard to the licensing. Um, they are rising, which is good. Active licenses are, are on the rise. Um, complaints, one of the things, again, that we talked about at the last committee meeting that, again, is illustrated here is that, you know, the Cases over at the AG office can impact, you know, that number, and you can have an outlier, and so that can affect, you know, your distribution. So just, you know, to keep that in mind. And then a little later on in the agenda, we've given you some additional information about the complaint breakdowns. So we'll get to that. Um, questions? Any committee members? Comments? No. Any public comments? Okay, moving on. Mm -hmm. The Guardian e-newsletter was published and sent to the interested parties list on June 22nd. It's also posted on the Bureau's website. Um, the newsletter is distributed biannually, and we are currently accepting articles. Uh, Angela would be happy to accept those articles or topics. Questions? 
on outreach. Uh, several events have been attended by the Bureau staff. May 12th, we had the Senior Resource Fair in Citrus Heights. June 1st through the 3rd was the uh, PFACT conference. And June 17th and July 15th, we had senior um, scam stoppers in Sacramento, Chico, and Paradise. And that was also done with the Contractor State Licensing Board. And I'm going to let Angela um, provide some additional details since she was at these events. <laughs> So the um, senior in Citrus Heights, is, they call it SOAR. It's an annual health fair that this is the second year that we've attended. And we've had a table. We did not speak at this event. But um, I've gotten, we've handed out um, materials and spoken to a lot of seniors and um, people from other agencies, <coughs> from caregiving groups, um, gotten a lot of good contacts. And I've had many people call me after seniors that have called me afterwards to ask questions regarding how do I find a fiduciary. And we have a um, brochure on the website which gives them a list of questions to ask fiduciaries. And so I always refer them to that. And if they don't have website access, I can you know actually send them a couple of the brochures so that they can use them when interviewing fiduciaries. The Professional Fiduciary Association Conference, which is PFAC, um, Jenny and I attended that conference in Indian Wells in June. Um, the Bureau spoke in the opening remarks session to approximately 600 attendees and talked a little bit about what the Bureau does, um, thanked them for all that they, the fiduciaries for all that they do. Most of them are licensees that attend the conference. And we also had a table and we were able to attend a couple of the seminars on information um, that was. Um, helpful to us in learning more about what fiduciaries do. Um, then the senior scam stoppers, those are um, set up by the Contractor States Licensing Board and they are sponsored by assembly members throughout California. The Professional Fiduciaries Bureau, because of our tight budget, is not able to travel very much. So if there's a senior scam stopper that's within the Sacramento area or not too far away that we can actually ride with contractors board, we go and speak at those events and also hand out materials, trying to get our information out to as many seniors as possible. Does anybody have any specific questions or comments? Uh, yes, this is King G. And uh, I had the opportunity to attend the uh, Sacramento Scam Stoppers uh, informational seminar that was sponsored by Assemblyman Cooper here in Sacramento, and um, I think there were about, as, an, as by way of information, there were maybe five or six other local and state agencies that were there, and it was held at the Asian Community Center here in Sacramento, which is a uh, uh, nonprofit organization that provides uh, community classes as well as programs for seniors. and. Uh, their facilities are used quite a bit here in Sacramento. For those of you that are not familiar with the organization, uh, they do things, just a couple of things, uh, major thing, programs, is the Meals on Wheels here in Sacramento, as well as in Placer County. Uh, they also have a five-star five rated uh, uh, nursing home, so, and it's just not uh, restricted just to uh, Asian clients, uh, just FYI for the public, it's open to everybody. And it just started with the name of Asian Community Center primarily about 25 years ago uh, because of the diversity and the uh, culture, but it's open to everybody. And uh, over the years, uh, it served the community quite well, and uh, I think the people in Sacramento will, will share that sentiment. Uh, also, Angela represented uh, our program very well at the uh, conference, and uh, it was a really good opportunity to uh, the public to have uh, that information disseminated, and I hope that uh, it'll broaden out to other communities throughout the state and not just the Sacramento area. Thank you, Kenji. Thank you, Angela. Any... Um 
member can come on. I know at one point we had a discussion about using the committee members to speak at these different engagements since we're in different areas. I don't know what ever happened with that. We just haven't ever had one that was in an area that we had. At the time, there was one person that volunteered to do it, and we had, didn't have anything in that area at that time. And we haven't looked into it any further. That may be something that the new bureau chief may want to discuss. It'd be nice to have a um, program format to follow um, that we all follow so we're on the same page in the presentation, but use us as a tool. And that was one of the things that that had been worked on, and there was kind of a template that was put together. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, though, I think that would probably be something for the new, the next bureau chief that comes in to make a decision on. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely make a note of that so we right. can pass that on. Thank you. Great point. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Okay, I'll continue with the status of the client notification regulations. Um, as you're aware, current law requires every DCA entity to adopt regulations that require its licensees to provide notice to their clients that the professional is licensed by the state. Uh, language was created uh, or to create um, California Code of Regulation 4640, which would require all professional fiduciaries licensed by the Bureau to provide notice to their clients or their client's legal representative that they are licensed and regulated by the Bureau. And so I'm happy to report that the regulations will be submitted on time. They had a due date of August 27th, and so they will become effective um, January 1st, 2017. And I'd like to thank the Bureau staff for keeping that moving. Um, because we got it through, made the deadline. Questions on this? Um, how is it, this is Donna Kell. How would the information then be transmitted to the professional fiduciaries? Very good question. It, it will be posted on the website and it'll be included in the newsletter. Um, I'm not sure if there's any direct other. We can also do it through the interested parties list. So there will not be a mailing sent to um, licensees, as far as I know. That's something we could talk about if... I think most people are on our email list, most of our licensees. I mean, there is... That is something we could talk about, is doing a mass mailing. Or at least contacting maybe the president of the Fiduciary Association to pass mm -hmm. it through down through the regions and the chapters. Hi, this is I.E. Federizo. So, uh, is it my understanding that the way it's worded, it's not that they must, but they shall, about that notification regulation? You mean shall? You mean shall versus may? Yes. It's must. must. It does, I, yeah, that was my clarification. Does it say must, or does it say they may? No, it's, it's a shall. It's a must. I can't remember. Not. I can't. It's not a. It's not an option. All you have to do all three so of the options. In legal terms, it's a shall. Yes. <laughs> Got it. Shall. Got it. Thank you. Okay, moving on to the strategic plan update. It expires this year, and then once the chief is appointed, this will be one of the items that um, the chief will be working on. Um, the Bureau and the Chief will work with the Department Solid uh, Training and Planning Office to revise this, the strategic plan. Um, we've included a copy of your current strategic plan and um, we're going to give you some homework to kind of review it and be ready to provide us with some uh, feedback when the time comes. Um, I'd like to remind you that the strategic plan is kind of a, a wish list of some sort, obviously goals that you're setting that the Bureau hopes to meet, but as um, time evolves, there will be certain things that come up that make some of these easier to achieve and others more, more challenging. So you'll see that some have been completed and others are in progress or some just haven't been completed. And again, there's various reasons. There's been some changeover in committee members. There's also, you know, financial resource um, 
um, variables that have to be considered. But again, I felt that it would be important to include this in here for you so that you can start reviewing it and giving it some thought so that when we do get ready to move forward with a new strategic plan, we'll have had some time to kind of digest it and review it. Questions? This is Eileen, Federal Brito. So, um, my understanding of the strategic plan is that we are assigned to certain things, but we still, in gen like generally, we still wait for the, um, the uh, bureau chief to contest about it. Is that correct, or did I misunderstand? I can't speak directly to how it's happened in the past, but typically, yes, your bureau chief would work with you and, and communicate some parameters, some sub-goals, and things like that, and identify how and when you would be moving forward with those. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And I don't know if this is appropriate, but I have one other question regarding the status client notification regulation. Is that okay to ask? Yes. Okay, so January 1st, 2017 arrives. How do we then enforce people to do this? Or is this something that the Bureau has land for? Like, is this going to be part of our, like, you know, how we check certain things or the Bureau checks certain things regarding the licensees? It, these types of situations um, would be followed up if there's a complaint. Got it. All right. So it's not going to be included in our random selection. It's not even random. Sorry. Not that I'm aware of. It. Yeah, not that I'm aware of at this time. Okay, got it. Other questions? Okay, I'll move on to yes. Angela has a comment. One comment on that, it would be included, and I, I don't have the code with me, but the code section that requires that you provide um, any records or documentation to the Bureau when requested within 10 business days. So if you did not send that and you didn't have a copy of it in the file, you wouldn't be able to prove that you had sent it. So that it would fall under that same statute. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the final item in my update is the complaint breakdown by type. Again, this was something that the committee members had asked for at the last meeting, and so um, staff um, worked through and identified the, the top five type complaint types for fiscal year 2015-16 and have them listed here for you. Um, unprofessional conduct, negligence, non-jurisdictional, personal conduct, unlicensed activity, and then there's just um, some examples of what these types of uh, complaints involve. So again, a sample uh, of the majority or more prominent types of complaints. Hi, Jenny Chihon. So um, thanks for doing this, and actually this gives us a better idea of what the challenges are. So obviously unprofessional conduct is a really high area of complaints. Um, so one thing that kind of gets back even to what this new regulatory requirement is, is that whole concept of the not, not knowledgeable and compliance with governing documents. Is that attributed to just them not knowing like any new regulations or what they should be doing? I mean, is that something that maybe education needs to be provided more to decrease those? Or what's the driving factor behind that? Like, why wouldn't they know that they are? Right. And I'll ask Angela if she might have some of that information. Um, in reading those complaints, if that comes out? Yes, yeah, so I actually did not include, this particular one was not one that I included, so I don't know exactly what the enforcement analyst uh, meant by this, but I believe that it would be govern do governing documents, governing their appointment. So like um, any documents in the trust, um, any, I think this also even includes like other benefits, like government benefits, um, and not, and so when you've got a special needs trust and the person's on government benefits, not handling the trust correctly so that their benefits are lost, that type of thing. That's my closest guess at this point, but that's what I think it was. And I can certainly talk to our enforcement analyst and get some more information. 
is it like a training issue or you know those kind of things like who would be in charge of ensuring that or fiduciaries being trained appropriately well generally a uh, fiduciary should be working alongside with their attorney so that's something that you should see between the attorney and the fiduciary and review um, sometimes that does not happen and sometimes it is an education we do get a lot of educational training as a fiduciary but working alongside attorneys and probate lawyers is really important so we understand the other side of the law and we can mirror them together to work in harmony and that's probably our biggest disconnect Any other questions about this handout? Okay, I've made some notes, too, to follow up with our analyst. And that completes my update. Any other committee members' comments? Any public comments? Thank you, Tracy. OK, so uh, now we go to the item number 11. The um, future agenda. So, Angela, what items have you recorded from our meetings as a future agenda? Um, I've, I've um, identified two. One is that Tracy has offered to follow up with our legislative office in um, following caregiver bills. And then the second one is to follow up on that last document for the follow up on government governing documents to see what the meaning of that is. Those are the only two that I captured from the meeting. Did anybody else? The strategic plan. We're going to talk about that again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The, 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 I mean, better we go. Uh, so my question is, how can the advisory committee be more helpful or effective to the Bureau in general? And maybe this is something that we can discuss when the chief is there or arrives. Uh, but I, I know I often wonder, you know, how effective are we? And this is uh, Tracy. I would say that, yes, uh, working with the new chief as well as uh, with the strategic plan and then building in some roles and some, some ways to... Uh, assist and represent and, and again it could be an individual member decision in the extent if you would like to attend outreach events or you know the extent of your involvement but certainly I think that that would uh, coincide with the strategic plan and then I have one other item that will be on the next agenda it's that time again it's the end of the year so we'll be having elections for chair and vice chair at our next meeting Is there any other item that committee members want to add? And if you guys think of things throughout the time, you can contact Tracy or myself. Myself, if there's something that comes up, I mean, we're always happy to add it before the meeting. Um, obviously, several weeks before the meeting because it takes a while to get all these documents ready. But you know, we're happy to add them if you think of something next week or the week after. Should um, so I. Earlier, I, um, I heard that we're going to do, uh, every one of us have homework to do. I uh, have to re review the uh, GGT planning. And so, can, so we're going to discuss that on the next meeting? We're not sure yet. It just depends, again, uh, whether or not there's a new bureau chief. And, and, and uh, we'll check with Saul in terms of their scheduling. But again, I just would like you to, to review it and, and keep it in mind that it is going to be coming up, that we're going to need your feedback. And Jenny, just one more question: um, Shouldn't we start thinking about calendaring for 2017 for the meetings? Because it'll be November. In November, when we meet, maybe we should have the dates at least proposed or something. Yes. So I'll have always in November. I have a list of dates that I've verified with our legal counsel, and I verified with meeting rooms, and then we I bring them in here. If they work for you guys, if they don't work, we can try to find another date. But I, I have to coordinate with so many different people within DCA that we do it that way. And then if we need to change things around a little bit, we can. 
So I'll have those at the next meeting. Okay. Okay. Is there any public comments on the empty <coughs> agenda? No? Okay, thank you. So now we go to the item number 12. Uh, the next meeting will be held on Wednesday, November 16, 2016, at this same location. Is there any public comment? No. Thank you. So now we go to the item number 13. Is there any public comment on the items that are not listed on the agenda? No. Should we adjourn the meeting? Yes, legal counsel? Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, the meeting is adjourned at 11.10.